Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, uh, the traditional custodians on the land on which we are gathered today. Uh, it's fantastic to see uh, everyone at the conference today and I welcome all our, the interstate travellers. I think it's fantastic that you come across to, uh, to WA for today's conference. Um, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the 2024 scholars um, and a special call out to uh, Ash Wees. I'm sorry I couldn't be there to present that last night. Um, I wasn't boycotting your presentation and it's, uh, it's actually nice to own you now, Ash, so that's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so this morning I've been given an opportunity to uh, talk to you a little bit about the CBH uh, group. I think for the West Australians you might find this uh, a little bit old hat, but it'll be great to uh, talk to the wider audience about CBH, a little bit of the history and um, uh, what we've got going on and what we think about what's happening in, the, in our near future. So if we look at the, uh, at the timeline here, um, CBH is 90 years old this year, which is... Uh, is a fantastic effort, I think, in modern day business for a for a company or a business, a cooperative to, to survive for that length of time. Um, the idea of the cooperative uh, came from uh, John Thompson, who was the second general manager of West Australian Farmers Cooperative, uh, another great West Australian cooperative that uh, did a lot of great work for rural Western Australia when they were a cooperative. Um, and Indeed, when the co-op was founded in 1933, it was uh, initiated by uh, the Wheat Pool of Western Australia and West Australian Farmers Cooperative. Now, uh, Thompson believed that the cooperative would be able to uh, have a more efficient way of handling grain and um, uh, brought that system into existence. So in 1933, it was founded and uh, you can see on the on the timeline there, it's a bit smaller smaller my screen, but we we received 42,000 and 42,500 tons of grain in our first year operation from f five trial sites. Uh, since that time, you can see uh, the growth through history and some some milestones there. I think if you consider the exponential growth to 1940, where we we moved to uh, 218 receivable sites. Uh, a lot of that was through um, the statutory uh, or the, the government legislation. That meant we had to build bins at so many sites, but um, th that became a uh, sprawling, sprawling mess across the state. And you can see our receivables at that point in 1940 from 218 sites was uh, a mere 1 million tonnes. So from that, uh, from that point uh, in 76, we opened the Quinana Grain Terminal uh, and I find it quite interesting that, and we, we refer to Quinana as the jewel in our crown, uh, that facility is capable of exporting 20 million tonnes in a, in a, in a year. Uh, and if you have a look at the year it was built, um, the, the total receival across the state was 4.6 million tonnes. Uh, so there's an asset that's 50 years old and we still haven't hit its capacity yet. Um, I'm not sure if that's called over overcapitalising or looking forward to the future and what's going to be required. Uh, looking further along the timeline, uh, the merger in 02 with the grain pool, which um, it just seems like a long time ago, uh, but that really facilitated um, CBH uh, moving into becoming an integrated supply chain at that point. And 2012, uh, another key piece which we'll talk about further was our investment in rail. Uh, and 22, I guess the high point uh, in my time on CBH and for the growers of Western Australia when we received a crop size of 22.8 million tonnes. So moving forward, uh, as um, Andrew said, CBH is Australia's largest cooperative uh, and um, it's Australia's largest exporter of grain. Uh, we've got uh, operations extending along the value chain, uh, including uh, fertiliser now, grain storage and handling, transport, marketing and uh, uh, processing both in oats and uh, flour mills up through Southeast Asia. We have uh, a network now that can receive over 20 million tonnes of grain each year and uh, we export around 90% of the state's crop uh, 
to over 200 customers in more than 30 countries around the world. CBH is also a major employer uh, in the state of Western Australia with around 1,200 full-time jobs and uh, at the peak of harvest we uh, take on 2,000 casual employees to receive that, to receive the crop. Uh, we've, you know, invested significantly in uh, infrastructure, but uh, uh, investing in technology is also a focus of the cooperative now uh, to help us create that world-class supply chain. Uh, the Paddock Planner is one example of this app, uh, of this, sorry, investment in technology where we uh, invite all growers to submit uh, what they're growing for the year and this uh, enables us to plan uh, the receivables for the year. But when we combine that with the harvest data we received from the CDF app, uh, that is the basis for our planning for investment, so where we deploy our capital in the network based on need. So CBH and the grains industry has evolved over the last 90 years and, um, and we very much need now to, as always, be prepared for the future and uh, CBH is very much focused on the future. Uh, these slides here sort of are the, the why, uh, the, um, the genesis for what we're doing and um, they're what we, we use for what we uh, call our path to 2033, which is what the strategy is called at this point in time. Um, the graph on the right uh, shows the average crop size and the crop growth uh, from 1990. Uh, the blue bars are the averages for the 10 years and you can see the peak of 22.8 being well above the average um, there. And I guess one thing with agriculture is that uh, volatility, if you track the line um, and consider how difficult that m makes it to uh, invest in an agricultural services bin uh, business, uh, you've got to have that longer term view on where you're headed uh, and um, uh, stay the course, I guess. Um, it also makes it hard for um, other businesses, uh, I think besides a cooperative, to invest capital in agriculture when you've got that volatility of production. Uh, and it perhaps means that it, in the good years they have to fill their boots to uh, carry themselves through the poorer years. As, you, as we go forward on that graph, um, we can see the average crop size of 22 million tonnes and we're projecting that we'll see peaks of 28 to 30 million tonnes, and that's what we're planning for. Um, the graph in the middle uh, represents uh, our shipping. So the green, the green line uh, at the bottom is what we've been shipping uh, through the 2010. So we're basically shipping 1.1 to 1.2 million tonnes a month. Uh, you come up a line to 2020 and we're sort of peaking at that 1.6 million tonnes a month. And what we're planning for with our path to 2033 strategy is to be able to export 3 million tonnes a month. So that's a doubling of our capacity. Um, and the reason why we do that, uh, if we exclude the last two years and the, the volatility in pricing that's been induced by the Ukraine situation, um, we quantify it to be a $25 delta for that front half shipping. So that's the value that um, we can generate by shipping more in the front half of the front half of the year. So that's the why, and then we move to uh, what we what we're doing about it with the strategy. So our purpose remains the same, and that is to sustainably create and return value to WA growers. Um, the key here is sustainability. Uh, that's probably an overused term at this point in time, but in our mind this is about uh, in building and investing in a network uh, that doesn't create sugar hits, it's going to generate those for the long term. And I, I think having a board of directors that's mainly growers, uh, and we do have strong alignment with management, but we see ourselves as custodians of the asset now. Not a lot like farmers, where we're trying to build on something great, we want to hand it on uh, in, in better condition and uh, serving its purpose as we go forward. Uh, the beneficiary, uh, I think, is very clear as well, or very um, uh, right that we acknowledge that. So it's WA growers, both current and future, so we've got that uh, future focus. Uh, so the strategy is a roadmap for how CBH 
uh, will be able to handle the average 22 million tonne crop uh, by 2033 and for our lifting capacity to, to be able to handle the peaks up to 28 to 30 million tonnes and our desire to export 70% of the crop in the front half of the year uh, when it generates that extra value. Uh, we've also have on there our uh, fertiliser business where we, um, we want to um, have a 15% market shares. So we want to create a competitive and transparent fertiliser market for growers. And we believe we can do this by just having a 15% share of that market. And our marketing and trading division, uh, uh, we would like to have the ability to um, trade 50% of the WA crop. Uh, and that means we need the systems and processes and the capital or finance available to do that. And if you contemplate uh, the in increase in the crop size uh, going forward, that, that requires a large capital base and uh, uh, some good systems and processes to handle that. So we're one year into this strategy now and we've got some, some runs on the board, I'd like to say, um, and I'll just highlight a few of those uh, that are making the, um, uh, I guess, the low-hanging fruit we targeted uh, the no capital spend to start with and um, uh, to a degree we've um, achieved 20 million tonnes of export already this year, uh, which is significantly higher than uh, our long-term average of around 15 million tonnes and we've done that mainly with um, organisational effort because a lot of the uh, capital that we have deployed hasn't hit the ground yet. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have done is uh, increase our rail fleet um, and we've purchased an additional seven standard gauge locomotive, locomotives, 17 narrow gauge and 650 grain wagons. Uh, and naturally they don't get delivered overnight so they'll be arriving over the next three years and will give us a significant uplift in our rail capacity. Um, still on the rail there we have a video playing, I think it's playing still playing there. So um, through uh, joint funding with the government, we've got 11 rail siding expansions uh, that the government is funding uh, through the ASCII package. And the Brook first one completed is the Brookton one. And on the other 10 sites, we'll be building rapid rail loading facilities, again, to um, increase that speed to port of the grain. Uh, we're also looking at embracing uh, technology as well to achieve those targets uh, in the strategy. Um, farmers are great innovators and can be fast followers of new technology and we're doing, it, doing a similar thing uh, on that side of the fence. When we look at the trucking space, uh, we've purchased two autonomous trucks which will run on our sites to uh, move grain from the railhead, uh, from the uh, bulkheads to the railhead. Um, and that's, that's a proof of concept trial. Uh, we're a fast follower there. These are the same trucks that MinRes are currently running on a 200K haul route with four, uh, pulling four trailers. We'll be pulling a single trailer around the site, moving grain to the railhead. Um, and then on the, perhaps on the, uh, the bleeding, ed bleeding edge side of adopting technology, we've been working um, on uh, the, uh, Another proof of concept, which is our uh, um, visual analysis of grain. There's a photo of the grain there. We haven't got a photo of the machine. And our grain technology team has been developing over the past couple of years uh, a, a visual analysis tool, which will give us much more consistent and accurate reading of uh, grain quality. Uh, and we will be deploying that at two sites this year to, uh, uh, to further test it. Uh, before hopefully rolling it out to, to um, uh, across the business. And um, I'd have to say there's, there is very strong interest from uh, all grain handlers if we can come up with a tool that um, provides a consistent result. Now, the key thing here is we have to calibrate that so that it um, uh, doesn't penalise uh, everyone with its accuracy and uh, gives, the, gives the right outcome, but um, watch this space. Some nervous faces out there. Is that a few wry smiles, perhaps. 
So I guess that there will always be uh, challenges um, in the grain industry, but the future uh, is one with you know immense opportunities. And I, I sort of catch that uh, because I think the last few years in the grain industry has perhaps been a golden period, and um, uh, uh, some of the challenges um, may bring us back, back, uh, back a little bit on where we've been in the last couple of years. But I think. There are a massive amount of opportunities out there and, and we need to just continue to capitalise on the strengths that we've got. Um, global demand for grain is increasing uh, exponentially, so um, I think we just have to set ourselves to, um, to pick our markets and, uh, and choose who and what we, we deliver in this space. Uh, growers, growers have always risen to the challenge and uh, I guess on that demand have continued to innovate and grow larger crops, uh, you know, the agronomic practices, and I perhaps uh, could uh, sweep Nuffield into that uh, conversation here on what we've achieved uh, as an industry, but it's around, you know, soil amelioration, seed varieties, enhanced equipment, uh, wetting agents, and, and all sorts of practice that have seen the crop size grow at, at such an exponential rate. Um, so in, uh, in uh, on this graph here, you can see it took uh, I think it was 58 years to get from 1 million tonnes to 10 million tonnes, um, and then uh, it only took the next 20 years to get from 10 to 20. So you can see that uh, I, don't, I don't think we quite compare to Moore's law of computing, but we are on a, a upward trajectory uh, that we need to um, we need to uh, embrace. So we are, we are continuing to invest in the network and it's, um, to ensure the su supply chain is efficient as possible uh, and we're ready to add value to uh, what growers grow. Uh, and I guess when we, when we look at that um, uh, growth and consumption, it's, um, it's normally driven by population growth and economic uh, development are the, you know, the primary drivers for uh, growth and consumption. But I think there's some uh, changes afoot there, and this is where Australia, I think, is is well placed to uh, to target some markets that have high expectations in terms of um, uh, clean and green, and um, you know the uh, the release of greenhouse ga gas emissions and production of food is coming into play. But Australia is is well placed to uh, take advantage of this, and I think uh, the co-op sees it has a role to make sure that growers are. Uh, are set to take advantage of that. Um, several of our larger customers have net zero pledges in place um, going forward, uh, some by 2030 uh, or as early as 2040 and zero by 2050. And they, they really cannot do that without uh, their scope three emissions uh, being part of the picture. And um, that, is, that is us in the room that are growers. Uh, uh, have to be part of that. So um, I don't think they can uh, can make these promises without bringing us into the conversation and out realising what we have to do to achieve that. So uh, CBH is out on the front foot finding out what is what is important uh, to the customer and uh, and uh, the nuances of uh, what they're what they're saying and what they're actually doing about it. So um, in a recent survey. Uh, CBH found that 36% um, of our customers are prepared to pay a premium uh, for low emissions or, or carbon reduction grain and 80% of them think that it's um, uh, critical or somewhat important to their business. So our, our position is to ensure that WA growers maintain a competitive advantage uh, and able to continue keep accessing and selling their grain to these markets. And again, I think the key point is that they, they literally cannot achieve their targets unless we're part of that conversation. And uh, very much in my mind, I see there's a window of opportunity where uh, other growers in the world will not be able to make uh, the targets that um, they're setting out to achieve. So um, it's up to us to, uh, to be ready to capitalise on that. Uh, in line with that, we have um, uh, set up our sustainability plan and we have adopted uh, six of the uh, UN sustainability goals across the bottom. 
And um, we've not done this to uh, make a rod for our own back. We think that these uh, goals actually make make good sense for our business, and uh, um, uh, we've adopted those and are working to those. So it's not only about ac accessing markets, uh, but making sure we're supporting and caring for communities, our people, and the environment. Um, we're very much aware that uh, some of these concerns, there are some concerns about the additional burdens or costs, uh, but I think uh, with the evolving expectations of the consumer, I think there's still the ability for us to, uh, uh, to benefit from that. So I guess the uh, farming industry, I think, is, is quite unique with how farmers collaborate uh, and share information. I don't, I don't see that across a lot of other industries. I see uh, uh, some level of collegiality, collegiality in the uh, grains industry uh, at the trading and handling level, but I think this uh, collaboration and information sharing we get as, as at a grower level is uh, second to none. And I think uh, the Nuffield scholars uh, are key to this and uh, can provide diverse points of view uh, from their international context, their travels, uh, and their collaboration with other growers from around the world. Um, your insights and intel uh, for growers are, are pivotal to our future. And um, I'd like to thank the Nuffield for facilitating your scholarships uh, and upholding your responsibility to deliver that, uh, uh, deliver and share your learnings from around the world. So thanks for your time today. Mm -hmm.